So I'd like I like to now move move to more towards the research side of the uh, of of the aisle and uh, talk about Dr. Paige Lawrence, who is the Wright Family Research Professor and Chair of the Department of Environmental Medicine. Uh, she is the director of our new University of Rochester Institute for Human Health and Environment. She's also been the PI and I think the longest standing grant in the United in the, in the University of Rochester. Uh, which is a toxicology uh, a center grant. And uh, I think that uh, there aren't that many places that have departments of environmental medicine. Uh, but I, I also think that it, at this point, uh, we're beginning to understand in a much more profound way uh, at uh, how important the environment is in causing disease, uh, both in terms of health disparity but also, uh, as we as we age more gracefully, we also are victims of the environment more and more. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lawrence uh, got her bachelor's in, in biology and chemistry from Skidmore College. I'm I'm not sure I knew that. So our daughter graduated, and and a doctorate in biochemistry, molecular biology, and cell biology from Cornell, and then did a postdoc at uh, Oregon State University. Uh, so please, Paige. It is a tremendous pleasure to be here. And I have to say, Georgia's presentation really resonated. I'm actually a child who grew up in a children's hospital, not where I grew up, not where my family was, in a different country where most of the people didn't even speak English. And so the idea that my family could have been closer and I could have been closer to home uh, is really meaningful. Um, it really impacts families' lives when they can stay in the region where they live. But I digress from, from my topic, which is that I'm really excited to get to share with all of you today about the University of Rochester's new Institute for Human Health and the Environment, which was just launched earlier this year. And so it's uh, in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of uh, the Institute. Um, but I st thought I'd just start with asking you all a question. When you think about health and let's use life expectancy, it's an imperfect measure of health, but as a measure of health, when you think about the things that influence life expectancy, what do you think is the most influential? So the answer is actually zip code. Where someone lives is the major influencer of life expectancy. And so we'll talk a little bit about what's under the hood of that, because it's really complicated and the environment that we live in is complicated. Um, but I just thought I'd give you a little example of that. This is Monroe County, where, where we are here in Rochester, New York. And this picture from the county is really fuzzy quality, so we have to live with the fuzzy quality. But the numbers on it are the zip codes around the county. And the, the, the shade of blue is life expectancy. And it becomes very apparent that there's a 10-year difference in life expectancy um, among the zip codes just within Monroe County. And this isn't only a, a fact about our local community, it's nationwide and it's global. So the World Health Organization actually estimates that at least 30% of deaths each year are attributable to the environment and environmental factors. And at first, maybe that sounds really depressing, but it's not, I, I, I think it's good news because if it's environmental, it means we could modify it. Um, and again, you know, life expectancy and WHO acknowledge this is probably an underestimate. This means we have lots of opportunity to improve health and reduce disease by understanding how does the environment influence health and disease, um, because those are things that we that are tractable problems that we can fix. Um, so what do I mean when I say environment? And I've learned in talking about this, and I run an apartment called Environmental Medicine. We talk about this a lot. Like, what does environment mean? And so we define it very broadly. It's the air we breathe and what's in the air that we breathe. It's the water that we drink, that we bathe in. It's stress, uh, socioeconomic stressors and other stressors. It's diet, it's nutrition, it's exposure to chemicals. Now, how many, when I say that, do you think something bad? Yeah, most of us do. It's sort of the culture we live in, right? But, you know, medicines are chemicals. Um, so, so chemicals can be good or bad, right? Chemicals don't have a value. They, um, it's what we use them for. But a lot of people and a lot of us are exposed all the time to chemicals that we're not aware of. 97% of the U.S. population has these chemicals called perfluoroalkyl substances in the, 
in us now. And, you know, so research here is now trying to understand, well, what do those chemicals in our bodies do because they're industrial byproducts that are in us and trying to understand. So we are also exposed to chemicals that we're less aware of, but infections. And, and now we're really becoming aware that the, the changing climate is influencing health. So how do we bundle all that together, recognizing that it's changeable? Um, life stage can influence how those things in the environment influence our health. So everybody experiences it in different ways. Um, and it's, it's ever changing. And an important concept is sometimes it's not the exposure right now that is influencing the disease that we're seeing right now. It's exposure from the past and how do we connect those dots. So pretty tall orders. Um, but what we're really now trying to think about is that confluence of genes um, and how do our genes influence health and disease and how does the environment then intersect with that? So we're, we really think a lot about gene and environment interactions and how can that tip the balance to you know, boost up the good things in the environment um, or decrease the, the negative things in the environment to improve health, um, well-being and help people have longer, healthier lives. So that's sort of the, the big picture uh, thinking that uh, is behind this. Um, and it's really that, you know, for the most part, I used to say you can't change your genes, but now I mean, technically you, you can sort of change genes. Um, but really, you can't really change your genes for the most part, but we can change the environment. Um, and so by understanding and supporting research that really unpacks how does the environment influence health, we have an opportunity to influence individual choices. Uh, community choices, population level choices. Some of the research that is done here influences policy. Um, so it really can come together to improve health by helping people um, have choices and make choices um, that reduces the negative aspects of the environment on health and, and bolsters the positive. So this new institute was launched in January of this year and it's nestled uh, in and interacts across the medical center and across the university. So I apologize for all the acronyms on this slide, but when I wrote out the full names of everything, the words got teeny tiny. Um, so the, the point that I really want you to take away is that the institute is really creating this new hub here and, and growing some programs that I'm gonna talk about in a sec that have been here for a while, as Mark alluded to. Um, and it spans the university um, and is really anchored here at the medical center and is also connected with our community, the county and the city and some community organizations um, that we work with. So the Institute has three arms or pillars as we call them, a focus on research. Um, we have an engagement pillar and uh, career development and education. So those are like the three mission areas of the Institute. Um, and really our, our overarching goal then is to, you know, accelerate how we're learning about and how we find new solutions to some of the challenges that we face that are all related to how does the environment influence human health. So I'm going to just tell you a couple of examples of research, uh, a little bit about engagement, and just a little tiny bit about uh, career development and education. But if you ever want to know more, I'd be happy to talk with any of you more about it. Um, as we were building the Institute, what bubbled up from the, the group of people here who are interested in this question was really four interrelated themes related to climate change and human health. Um, what's in the air? Um, and the water in particular in our local region, but also uh, nationally and globally, and how does that influence health? Environmental justice or environmental health disparities. Why, why is zip code such a big definer of, of life expectancy? And, and there's some disparities there and, and how can we address those, those health disparities that are related to the environment? And then that concept that I mentioned earlier of lifelong influences. How do we understand what happens, for example, in the womb or during early childhood influence the likelihood that you are or are not going to develop a disease like Parkinson's later in life. So not for nothing, we are not starting from scratch. Uh, Mark alluded to some of the history that U of R has had in national leadership in environmental health that really dates all the way back to the 1940s and the Manhattan Project. Um, U of R did start the first toxicology PhD program in the country. That program is still going strong. It's right here at the Med Center. Um, and I really am proud that the PIs of a NIH training grant just got that funded again. And that takes it, it will take it into its 50th year of continuous funding. And it's one of the largest training grants here at U of R. 
Um, we, I am also have the privilege of being the principal investigator for a grant that's almost in its 50th year. I did not start the grant. Um, I really <laughs> stand on the shoulders of, of several people who, who got the grant initially and, and have carried it forward, but we're really proud of this grant. And these have built- <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but really this institute stands on the shoulders of these programs and an evolution over time. I kind of think of it like, a snowball rolling down the hill and, and the snowball's just been growing. And this institute has is really a way of us pulling together lots of groups uh, and people here at U of R who um, are interested in tackling these topics. And already the new institute has affiliations from faculty and student learners um, who are in over 25 different departments and programs across the university. Many of them are here at the medical center, but also uh, on the undergraduate campus in the School of Nursing in Warner School of Education. Um, and so we're, we've gathered lots of people together and continue to gather people together to feed forward uh, people's interest in this topic. The philosophy for the whole institute, so I didn't have the privilege of going to the University of Rochester, I went to Cornell, so I always use a quote from my famous uh, favorite Cornellian, which is Bill Nye the science guy. Um, but really our philosophy for the institute is, is to solve these issues and understand how the environment influences health and then to do something about the negative aspects of that. We really need teamwork that's cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, and we have to work together uh, with engineers and chemists and social scientists, and we all need to come together. Um, so that's sort of our operational philosophy. And really what the Institute has started off by doing is bringing people together, sharing ideas, seeding collaborations with pilot grants, um, where if somebody has an idea, we can help them get it off the ground. Uh, fostering student learning, we're actually developing a new undergraduate course in toxicology, which students really want. Um, so launching new educational programs, um, creating this new knowledge, using that to solve problems, and also supporting research to say, hey, we think we've got a solution. We roll it out. Did it actually do what we thought it was going to do? And then tweak it, learn from it, and then start the cycle again, sort of rinse and repeat. So that's sort of how the, the Institute is planning on operating. I wanna give you a couple quick, very short stories to give you an example of what I mean when I'm talking about research. So again, this is uh, SPAN's department. So Kiersey Yarvin and Seppo, who's in pediatrics, um, is doing research to understand what are the factors in the environment that, that contribute to why some children develop food allergies and some don't. And really then, how can we understand that to prevent food allergy and other allergic diseases in children? Martha Susiarjo, who's in, in my home department of environmental medicine, is uncovering how endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment, which again are fairly common, um, how they affect maternal fetal health and trying to understand molecularly how that happens and then using vitamin supplementation to counteract that. And so what can we do about it? How does it work? What can we do about it? Lee Murray is using um, AI technology and big data to develop these really cool new models to understand um, how air pollution affects health and how climate change is shifting where air pollution is occurring so that we can get in front of it. And instead of reacting to climate change, instead of reacting to air pollution, we can be in front of it and know where it's gonna change, how it's gonna change and put health measures in place proactively to prevent disease. Other examples uh, that I could give you, and I can give you lots of examples, right? There's, there's lots of affiliates with the Institute, um, but three that I'll sort of jointly discuss, uh, span departments. Um, and it's really trying to understand again at the molecular and cellular level, all the way up to the population level, how do exposures to things in the environment um, like solvents and air pollution early in life, set the table for making it more likely that someone's going to develop Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease later in life. And again, how can we stop that march so that we can reduce these diseases? And if you ever get a chance to talk to Ray Dorsey in neurology, he will convince you that Parkinson's is 100% preventable, that it is an environmentally caused disease and we have to understand that so we could just prevent Parkinson's, which I think is a fantastic goal. 
So none of the research that we do here happens without students and fellows and learners. And so these are just some, some pictures assembled to just really make it clear that, that innovation education is at the core of what we do. And the learners include undergraduates, graduate students, medical students, as well as high school students, high school teachers in that train the trainer modality where we, we run a lot of workshops. Um, and really all of this feeds into the research and the education, and they are really tightly intertwined. Um, we also work a lot with the community. And um, just to be clear, when I say community engagement, I don't mean experts from U of R go out into the community and tell people what to do. We actually go out and we listen to the community. We talk with community members and we find out what interests them, what are they concerned about? And that actually feeds into some of the research that we do here. So the top row of pictures up here are some undergrads at the Rochester Public Market. Uh, getting feedback from and talking with community members about um, what they're concerned about. And this actually gave rise to a research project that's now funded. Um, it was about microplastics, these little tiny pieces of plastic that are in the water. Uh, people got concerned because they were actually discovered in some beers that are uh, made in Rochester, uh, which I think was uh, was kind of funny. But, um, but people started saying, hey, wait, these microplastics are in the water. They've been discovered in fish. Are they in us? And the answer is, yeah, they have been detected in people. Does that matter? Should we be concerned? And so Jim McGrath now has a whole grant studying that. How do they get in and cross biological barriers? And what health effects might they cause? And this is actually a global question. And lots of people around the planet are trying to understand this. We don't have an answer yet. Um, but I'm confident that with Jim and his leadership, we'll get there. Another uh, community interest question that's bubbled up and that's now funded by a federal grant uh, is led by Dr. Katrina Korfmacher, where people, uh, we have a healthy home project that U, U of R has been involved in for quite a while, but they wanted to know really what's in my home, because how can we understand what's in your home and how could it connect to health if we don't really know what's in the home? She's pictured they're holding a vacuum cleaner, because as part of this, they actually go around people's homes, uh, vacuum stuff up, and then work with a chemistry team. They're actually analyzing what's in that house dust. Um, that people are exposed to. And again, we have to think long-term. We won't know the answer to this for a couple of years, but that will help inform more research and grew out of a community interest. So my time with you is almost up, um, but I hope that this graphic kind of makes you think about U of R's biopsychosocial model, because really the Institute is really living that model from the beginning to the end, really thinking about mechanistic research, cellular level, whole, whole organism research, to thinking about individuals, groups of people, um, communities, healthcare settings, educational settings, where people work, um, and then thinking about things like air quality, water quality, what's in our water, um, but also how do we communicate about this, um, and then how do we end environmental health disparities, so I think, uh, which are really related to health disparities um, and how do we kind of span that whole spectrum. And so I think the Institute really touches across this whole spectrum. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Elegant, um, Barry Roth. When I went to the public market in the early 50s, my grandmother would get chickens that we'd pluck at home. Um, I went to Monroe High with George Engel's daughter, class of 69 at Cornell. Uh, in 71, I did a research project with Frank Williams, unmet needs of health care for the elderly in Monroe County. I, I have the 20 page manuscript, love to share it. Um, in terms of the biopsychosocial model, when I was researching it, it was clear biopsychosociocultural model. And in my own work, what I say is that individuals are the infinitesimals whose sum in the calculus of culture creates society. Um, and uh, there are so many things. It's just wonderful to see your work. And the question, when I was here, we were taught 85% of healthcare costs were due to preventable illnesses, as you sketched out. And um, uh, how's that going? I think we have a lot of work to do. But I think 
I think we hope to raise attention to that because I think we can really prevent a lot of diseases um, if we start understanding causality. And there's just a lot of gaps in knowledge um, that I think create barriers to practical steps. Um, so I'm hoping we can chip away at some of those. Um, you mentioned the chickens and things that made me think. So one of Kiersey Yarvin and Seppo's projects, she actually is working with a Mennonite community that has very low allergy and an inner city Rochester community where allergic disease is quite high and trying to understand these differences in lifestyle and environment and how that is actually influencing the allergic march of disease. And I think that's really fascinating. Yes, this has really been fantastic. How do you look at the question of trying to make sense out of the fact that wealth or lack of wealth, education, ethnicity, uh, ed, you know, and the neighborhoods are made up of such a complex so social as well as environmental. Uh, are these just markers that we don't understand all will go back to your work or are they independent risk factors uh, and we need to, to look at them separately? I think it's a great question, and that's why, A, we need teams of people, and B, it's both. I think we need to look at them individually and look at them together. Um, and by kind of thinking only one or the other, I think we shortchange ourselves on learning. So I think we really need to do both um, and just keep integrating the knowledge that we get. Because sometimes you got to break something down into its simplest parts to understand it, but then you got to put it back together again. Oh, um, so um, when we were uh, students here, we got to follow women who had just given birth. And one of the observations I made was I went to see a woman who lived in one of those uh, zip code areas that um, had high mortality. And the tenement that she was living in was very hot. The child was wrapped up all the way, the only place that the child could really sweat was for the top of her head and milia and so forth and so on. So I was aware of the issues regarding the environment. But my question is, when you do environmental research, a lot of it has to be done retrospectively, which is not the gold standard for doing tests. So I was going to ask, what sort of prospective studies do you have that will answer some of the questions you're asking? That's a great question, and you're right. A lot of times we're looking backward, but we're really trying to look forward. Um, so work like Kiersey, Jarvin, and Seppos that I mentioned is actually trying to look forward. Um, we have multiple cohort studies with individuals that we're following now. Um, you have to take the slow road. Like part of the research that I'm working on is we've been following infant mother pairs. The kids are now adolescents. So the, the progress is slow because humans age at a certain rate. So in parallel, we also do research with cell culture and animal models to try and fill in the gaps and keep us the work moving forward. So again, you kind of need to take a multi-pronged approach, um, but I think we are pivoting to doing more um, prospective research and asking questions and using some of the lab research to inform how we design those prospective studies. So thanks for the question. I think we probably have to, we have one more, and that's, we got to move on. I'll, I'll make my presentation shorter, so you got, you, you got time. No, you, you mentioned Dr. Dorsey's work in Parkinson's disease, but really work by him and others has totally upended what people think about the disease entity. You might want to touch on that if you've got time. Touch on Dr. Dorsey's work? Yeah, I think... Um, the idea that there are associations with environmental exposures that do a lot to explain Parkinson's is a radical idea. Um, but I think it's really gaining traction, not only here, but um, Tim Greenemeyer, who's um, at, in Pittsburgh, has really been a leader in this area. Um, and there's a group down in Alabama that's also provided some really compelling evidence that that environmental exposure to solvents in particular has been strongly associated with Parkinson's disease. There's also a genetic element, uh, but the genetics in Parkinson's explains a very small percentage of Parkinson's cases. So um, I think we now need to do more work to show cause and effect, but it's a pretty radical idea. Thank you, Paige. And 
I, I, I hope you get a feeling for the, what, the exciting work that we are trying to do uh, in, in dealing with the effects of the environment. 